You know, I was really trying hard to figure out what sort of introduction I could make for this sermon that would really grab your attention. I briefly considered just screaming really loudly. But after struggling for a few days this past week, I came up with something that I realized was right in front of my face the whole time. And I don't mean that in a figurative way. I mean it quite literally. It was right in front of me. By now, you probably all have seen the funny line that's currently on our church sign out front. It reads this, are you reading this? It's a sign. Now, this is funny because it clearly has two meanings. It has the literal meaning of that is, in fact, an object that we call a sign, as the children pointed out. But similar to all the examples I gave to the children in the children's message earlier, but it also is saying with a little wink and a nudge that it's an act of providential meaning that you happen to be reading our sign today. It's a signal that should point you to come and check out our church or more accurately, come and check out Jesus. Now, in our gospel reading today from John chapter 6, there are a group of people described as the crowd who are desperately searching for Jesus. Now, these people are a portion of that large crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children whom Jesus had just miraculously fed with five loaves of bread and two fish. And the text for today highlights that even though they are seeking after Jesus... Their reasons for doing so are not good. Their reasons betray their lack of understanding about who Jesus is and what He has come to do in Israel. We can learn from their mistakes. We can learn because it's likely a mistake that we have made and one we continue to make in our own lives. We can learn from their mistake because of what Jesus reveals in His conversations with them once they find Him. He reveals that even though they were seeking Him, They didn't see the signs. No, not signs like the one out front in our church building. He means the signs as signals of God's action through His Son, Jesus, that were pointing to an even greater work of provision to come. Now, first, let's look at the mistake that these people are making. They're seeking Jesus, and yet they're still making a mistake. That sentence alone is tough to hear, isn't it? I thought if I was seeking Jesus that everything else was all good. So, pastor, are you telling me that I can seek Jesus in the wrong way? Well, not me, but Jesus is going to tell us the answer to that question today. The text begins with the crowd, and they remained where they were after the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. I mean, imagine for a moment, right, you're in the ancient world, it's not always a guarantee that you're going to get a solid meal every day. And you meet somebody that can turn five loaves of bread and two fish into enough food to feed thousands, tens of thousands of people and have plenty left over. They're so enamored with Jesus in John 6, a little before our reading for today, it says that they were going to take him by force and make him king. So they're sticking around because Jesus can do pretty amazing things. They want to see Jesus. But we can already see they aren't off to a good start in their understanding of who He is and what He's come to do. As they search for Jesus, they get thrown off the trail quite understandably because Jesus kind of circumvents what you would normally expect on a trip across the lake by walking on the water, right? So they're waiting around to see Him on a boat. They know the disciples left in a boat, know Jesus, they're confused, but they decide to go to Capernaum to find Him. So in our reading today, verse 26, they finally catch up to Jesus, and Jesus says this to them, "'Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking Me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves.'" Now here is where we see that according to the man himself, Jesus himself, you can seek Jesus incorrectly. Jesus is telling them that they have misunderstood His actions. In fact, they've misunderstood who He is. He hasn't come to be some earthly bread king, nor has He come primarily to fill their stomachs. They are seeking Jesus, in short, because of His benefit to them. And in His conversation, Jesus rebukes them. And He rebukes them because He knows that this is not a good path for them to be on. He doesn't want them to think He has come to feed them only earthly bread. They're missing the main point. They didn't see the signs. 
So he tells them what sort of food they should go after instead of this earthly food. Because presumably, the text doesn't say this, but part of the reason they're looking for Jesus is maybe they're hungry again. After all, they ate that bread yesterday. So he says this to them in verse 27. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on Him God the Father has set His seal. Like the living water He describes to the Samaritan woman at the well, here Jesus is emphasizing that the satisfaction they feel right now from the bread He provided is temporary. It will not endure. They are going to be hungry again. So, does the crowd now understand what Jesus is saying? Well, their initial response might at first seem to lend to their credit, that they did pick up on what's really going on here, and that because they say, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Fair question. But as they continue to talk with Jesus, the same ignorance that caused them to chase Jesus in the first place remains. They still don't see the signs. Like the woman at the well, they must be thinking of a magical loaf of bread that would satisfy them forever. They wouldn't need to eat ever again. How convenient would that be? Especially in a time and a place where food was scarce. So they say to themselves, I'll do whatever it takes to receive such, quote, bread from heaven. So what is the work that we need to do in order to receive this bread? So Jesus answers their question. What is the work we need to do? He says, this is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. That's it. Now, their response to this is to ask for proof that Jesus is, in fact, the one whom God has sent, which is pretty ironic considering the reason that they're coming here, right? So, they clearly didn't see the signs because they still don't know what's going on. So they say to Jesus, demanding proof, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? An ironic question coming from them, of course. As the discussion continues, it becomes clear that they think Jesus is a new prophet like Moses, for they draw a comparison, right? And this is actually what they call him in verse 14 before our reading today after he performs the miracle of the feeding. So when they ask for a sign, they want something like the manna in the wilderness. After all, Moses gave them bread from heaven too, right? But let's step out of the text for a moment. Before we judge the crowd too harshly on their missing the signs, we ought to recognize that their mistake is one we share. Each of us falls into the temptation to seek out Jesus because we didn't and don't see the signs. And we also seek Him out because of what He can do for us. This sinful tendency reveals itself in our Christian lives when He says or does something that we don't agree with or like. For example, when we feel betrayed when He doesn't answer our prayers in the time or manner in which we would like. Were you only praying to God because He's supposed to answer and satisfy your desires? Or when the Bible tells me that marriage is between one man and one woman, that I can't tell lies to get ahead in life, that I must hold fast to Him even if it divides my earthly family, or any of the other hard words of Jesus that we read in the Scriptures. Is He only my Lord when He agrees with me? Just as Jesus is correcting and guiding this crowd onto the right path, he corrects and guides us whenever we approach Him as a means to our ends. He mercifully teaches and guides us into an even greater truth than the one we or this crowd could imagine. They're stuck thinking of a bread king who can give them bread to the full every day, thinking of Moses in the wilderness, but God has something far greater in mind with Jesus. Now let's get back to the text. In verse 32, Jesus begins a section where He reveals this greater truth that His previous signs, the feeding of the 5,000 and all of His other miracles are pointing to. He reveals that when this crowd is thinking of Jesus as a prophet like Moses or a bread king, they have put Him in the wrong category. He first says to them in verse 32, "'Truly, truly, I say to you, 
It was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the bread from heaven. Moses wasn't the provider of the manna. It was God. And not only did He provide you bread then, but partway through this verse, He shifts from past tense to present tense. And He says, my Father gives. Gives, as in currently is providing bread from heaven. And Jesus goes on to answer the last question of this section, what is this bread? He says, for the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. In other words, if you're going to compare Jesus to the account of God's provision in Exodus in the wilderness, you shouldn't choose Moses as the comparison. You should choose the manna itself. Jesus is saying here that He Himself is the very provision of God. This is why His greater provision of the bread from heaven that God is sending in Jesus was the thing that the feeding of the 5,000 pointed to. It was a sign for this truth. No longer a provision for temporary hunger on earth, but one that, quote, endures to eternal life. That sounds amazing, right? Well, the crowd thinks so too, and their response is, sir, give us this bread always. And in response to this plea, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now, that isn't a promise that came along with the manna in the wilderness. It is an even greater promise, a promise given to this crowd, a promise given to you. All the other provision of God in the Scriptures, the manna in the wilderness, the feeding of the 5,000, they're all signs that point to this great and ultimate provision from God, your new life in Christ. So, dear friends in Christ, you and I come to Jesus at times not seeking the right thing. We come not seeking Him, but we come seeking the things we think He will give us or do for us. So, I think we can resonate with the idea of being enamored with a Jesus who can miraculously multiply bread and fish and feed me all I need every day. But we can also resonate with the fact that sometimes we're a member of this crowd that's following Jesus that doesn't see the signs. We only see the benefits of being around someone like Jesus. Today in our text, we see His mercy on full display for people like us. He graciously corrects us and guides us back to the real reason we ought to come to Him. We believe in Him, full stop, not because of what He can do and might or might do for us, but because He is the one whom God the Father has sent, not because He is a means to our own ends, but because He is the means and the end. It turns out He is in Himself the means, the provision of our eternal salvation. I pray that is why you are here today, because it is here that the Father gives the true bread from heaven. Here the Word made flesh is given in the reading of the Scriptures and the reception of the sacraments, and the only work required is given as a gift from God Himself, faith in Him whom He has sent our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, amen.